Okay, results chains or cadenas de resultados are, uh, it's, it's a methodology that helps link actions to outcomes. And Déjame it can be allá. used in, está bien, Enrique, todo bien? Ah, bueno. Um, yeah, so, so results chains are a way, like if you're doing on the ground, environmental work it's a way to say our is our investment is our investment meeting our desired outcomes and in research it's slightly different but it's a way to link the actions that you're doing in research to the environmental or social outcomes that you're trying to get to a lot of times in research we think oh yeah if i just do this research and provide this data or this information that the decision makers the policy makers or the natural resource managers will take the information and use it and the world will be a better place and a lot of times that doesn't happen because we make assumptions about if we are to just write a paper or produce these results that's that the end result of a, a sustainable system a sustainable watershed will occur and uh that's something that the results chains helps us drill in and be more specific about exactly how we are going to achieve our ultimate results. In order to understand what we're talking about, there's a, some fundamental vo vocabulary. Here on the left side here, we have final result. Okay, and that sometimes we call our goal of the project or the fundamental objective. And then we have intermediate outcomes. And those are the things that have to happen in order for other things to happen. They're not the end result that we're going for. The end result that we're going for sometimes is outside of the scope of a project, of a scientific project. It might even take 10 years or 15 years to reach that final objective or the final, the fundamental objective. But we are saying, if we achieve our intermediate objectives, we're on our way to getting there. And then actions and strategies are the individual actions that we are going to take in the project. We're going to host workshops. We're going to collect data. We're going to interview fishers. We're going to do these various uh, actions. So that's, I wanted to, to stop and just have a vocabulary check. The goal and the fundamental objective is the very end game. It's the reason why we're doing the work in the first place. Could be social, could be environmental. Then the intermediate outcomes are the things that happen in, in between to get us that it, we have to do these things in order to, to achieve that final result. And then the actions or strategies are the little things that we do to make, to make the, um, the ball move. Here's an example, and I'm, and I'm seeing part of my screen is cut off because I have the share screen at the top of, of my window. But if you, this is just what a, what a results chain looks like at the end after you've already created one. And this is a simple one. This is a very simplified case, but I wanna just walk through it to show what we have. So we have the action or the strategy, which is eco certification of timber harvest. So we say in the way that we read, the way that we read results chains is from left to right. And you say, if then, if this happens, then this will happen. And if that happens, this other thing will happen. And if that thing happens, then this other thing will happen. And if that happens, we reach our final end point. So that's how you read a results chain. If, then, if, then, if, then. That's very important. So keep that in mind. Write that down. When it comes for you to make your results chain, the if, then, you walk through. If this happens, then this other thing will happen. And then the, the thing that I love the most about results chains is it allows us to test our assumptions. Because if you say, if this happens, then this other thing will happen. That's an assumption. And you can test it. So your monitoring and evaluation plan is easy to write when you have a, a results chain. Making sure that your project is on track and achieving its desired outcomes is easy if you have a results chain. So the, in this example, we have eco certification of timber harvesting. If we do that, then loggers are going to implement eco certified practices. And if they do that, 
then the loggers are going to get more money for their certified products. And there's a feedback loop there in this results chain. If loggers are getting more money for certified projects, then there will be a greater recognition of the forest economic value. If there's a greater recognition of the forest economic value, then unsustainable logging will decline. And if unsustainable logging declines, the forest will be conserved. Okay, so that is how you read a results chain. It's from left to right, if then. When you create a results chain, you do it backwards. You start from, if the forest, if, the, if we want the forest to be conserved, I lost my mouse, where'd it go? There. Hello. Okay. If we want the forest to be conserved, then what do we need to have happen? So this is when you create, to, to create for your projects. You start with the very, uh, the thing that you want the outcome to be, the forest is conserved. So in order for that to happen, you need unsustainable logging to decline. Well, what do we need for unsustainable logging to decline? Well, we need a greater recognition of the forest economic values. Well, what do we need for a greater recognition of forest values? Well, we need loggers to get certified, to get more money for certified products. Well, what do we need for loggers to get more money for certified products? Well, we need loggers to implement eco-certified practices. Well, what do we need for them to implement eco-certified practices? We need to figure out a process by which we, harvest, uh, we certify timber harvest. So when you read it in your proposal, you read it from left to right, but when you make it, when you're, when you're the author, you make it from right to left. Any questions on that? Great. Okay, so here's some slides that we, um, we had invited Matt Muir from the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, is, which is who I work for right now. And uh, Matt is an expert in results chains. So when we first did a, uh, a training, a proposal writing workshop for the IEI Small to Grants Program in 2018, we asked him to put together a presentation on results chains. And uh, so I wanted to acknowledge that I took a lot of these slides from Matt. He did a great job already preparing them. And, and so I was able to, to reuse those. But uh, Matt will walk us through some examples of how results chains are used in research. And, and so hopefully you can start to see how it might be useful in your project or see your project in the context of, of some of these examples. So again, we have the if then statements. They're causal. If this happens, then that uh, this other thing will happen because it caused it to happen. So we're looking for the cause and effect across the result chain. We have the strategy or action. We have an intermediate result or many intermediate results that then lead to a result which is kind of taking care of the, the driving factors. And then if the driving factors are, are addressed, then you're going to have uh, an impact. You're gonna see a change in your fundamental objective or that big goal watershed sustainability, for instance. And so this is your map of how you think your work is going to have societal impact. It might be wrong, but that's okay. That's why we do research. We do research to test hypotheses, to test our assumptions, and to learn. And, and so we are mapping out. We think that if we do this research, that we will have this societal or environmental impact because of this logic, this, this theory of logic. And then you test it throughout the project. And if it's not having the impact, great. That is not failure. That is success because we're learning and then we can adjust and we need to publish on that. We need to say, hey, guess what, everybody? We thought this worked and it doesn't. So don't do it, you know, we need to come up with a different way collectively as a community rather than continuing to put money and funding and resources towards a type of research that's not meeting its desired impact. So there is no failure in this. 
And another big point is that we are focusing on the achievement of results, not the execution of act of activities. So often in our annual reports or our final reports, we say, oh, we had five workshops and the, for a total of 300 people. Isn't that amazing? That's not a result. That's an activity. The result would be we had five workshops and because of those workshops, we had a change in the way that fishers are thinking about the timing and the seasonality of harvesting. That's a result of the workshops. So be thinking about results, not just activities. And then again, your assumptions can be easily tested. So if you are saying, if this happens, then this will happen. Well, monitor it, measure it, quantify it. Did that happen? And if not, we have a feedback loop. That's what co-production transdisciplinary research is all about, is making sure that we are working with the end users, making sure that we're working with the greater society to have an impact. And if we're doing something that's not helpful, it's not, it, it's not reaching its desired results, that is a win because now we know and we can do something different. We can change our approach. We might even change our entire objective with that knowledge. The worst thing we could do is to continue down the funding cycle and then get more money, look for more money in the future and, and have no impact at all from our work. That's what we're trying to avoid. So if, um, I think I've already beat that point to, <laughs> to death here about testing your assumption, but it's a really, it's a really great part of results chains, not only to map out your mental, uh, your, your mental map of, of how your work is going to have impact, but it allows you to test your assumptions. And so who's using results chains? Well, the answer is a lot of different organizations are requiring results chains as part of their proposals. So if you learn it here in this, in this process with IAI, hopefully this will be information that will be useful for you in the future with different proposals down the road. So you'll see there's a lot of different governmental, NGO, international, national, a lot of different organizations say, if you don't have a results chain, we will not fund your proposal. The results chains, uh, the way that, that I'm describing them here, were developed by the Comfort Conservation Measures Partnerships and also called Open Standards. And it was a group initially of 13 non-governmental organizations that worked on global biodiversity that came together and said, let's streamline the way that we do our, our biological planning and how we, how we can not only plan for achieving biodiversity results, but how do we know when we're actually getting there? So they developed results chains and they use them Negro, uh, in part of their, of their cycle. El curso. Así me meto un... Es un... Ya entré tarde, así que... Okay, can you hear me? Good. Okay. Yeah, you're good, Amanda. Great. All right. Great. Um. So so they they use results chains uh, for strategy selection. They also use it um, during when they're planning their actions and also developing their monitoring their monitoring plans. Okay. So here's an example. Christina Lash is uh, a Mexican researcher and, and colleague, and she uses results chains in her research to identify knowledge gaps and research needs. She wants to focus her research on areas where there's high uncertainty or where information gaps are keeping people from making good decisions, okay? And then she's prioritizing research needs and allocating the resources based on where those actions are going to have the most impact for policymakers and, and um, natural resource managers.
Another example that I'm going to follow all the way through is Caroline Stem from the US. And she was actually the one who taught me how to do results chains. She's from the Foundation of Success. And she uses results chains to clarify how the research results are going to be linked more effectively to the larger societal or environmental outcome. And then the last example is uh, within the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, and um, Matt had organized these examples in um, order of increasing complexity. So we're gonna start with the simple ones and then we're gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then we're gonna share some, some examples from the IEI SGP, uh, which you'll see how complex it gets in real life. But we're gonna start start simple and then and work our, our way more broadly. But we start with the proposal, then the statement of research need, and then we start to think about implementation and the actual research that's being conducted. And then we think about what that desired result is and the application of that research. And then we want to end up with the very, you know, the, the social ecological outcome that we're trying to get. So that's the order of um, when you're doing this for research, the order is you can start all the way back with the proposal and take it all the way to that fundamental objective. So with the US Fish and Wildlife Service, Again, we're going to read it from left, left to right. The first activity, the strategy is research and status monitoring. We're also going to identify research needs and develop a research plan. So those are the three actions or activities or strategies that are happening. And the first objective, the, the intermediate or the means objective, is that priority management info, information is identified and a plan to collect those data is developed. Okay, so they said, given the fact that we're, we, you know, the action, we're identifying inf in, uh, information needs, we're developing a research plan, and we're going to be monitoring. So the desired outcome from those activities is to have an a information needs and, and data collection plan developed. If we have that plan developed, then we are going to collect good data that will be useful for management recommendations. So there's your assumption. You're assuming that if you have a good plan, that then you'll collect good data that are needed to make decisions. So then the, the action or the strategy that comes in is conducting the research and analyzing the data and developing recommendations. So you're saying if, we have good data and we conduct the research and we analyze the data and develop recommendations, then those recommendations are going to be used to inform management. If our management decisions and actions are used then we're gonna communicate the results to others so that they can also use them, then we are going to meet our goals, which are, are here on um, just in a generalized sense where we have our actions are improved, our threats are reduced, and species and habitat, because this is the US Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, are doing better. Here is that same results chain in Spanish. I'm going to just pause for a minute um, for, for um, you to read this. It's the same information that we just shared, but now in Spanish. Here is a little bit more complicated example, a little bit closer to reality. So we know that it's, it sounds simple in our heads, but once we start to write it down on paper, things can get pretty complicated quickly. So here we have our applied conservation research. We have identified key information and we have a plan for doing the research and we have identified new protocols or, or want to develop new protocols. So then the first outcome is that we've identified protocols and key information. Who's gonna use the information? What's their tolerance for uncertainty? What's the minimum data required, et cetera, to go into the new protocols. If we have the new protocols, then the data that we collect are better are going to better 
address management questions. So these are like natural resource managers or um, health managers or uh, different, different members of society. If they are collect, if, if the research team is collecting the right information, then there's a, there's a, 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 a pass go right here. Are the data sufficient to answer the management questions? If yes, you keep on going. If no, you go back to the protocol stage and try it again. So your results chain can have a bifurcation where you can say, are we being successful or are we not? And the feedback loop, if you're not successful, in this case, will take you back to the beginning to say, okay, well, we tried, we didn't get it right. That's important information. That's not failure. That is learning. And so that's a success. But if you do, then you pass the test and you go forward to the next step. So you might wanna consider including those in your project. That's an automatic monitoring location. You're going to be collecting data. You're gonna be doing surveys. You're gonna be doing interviews for to, to answer that question in your project. Get the green, you're going to say, okay, if we have the this, this sufficient data, then we're gonna develop recommendations for conservation action based on data. If we have recommendations, then we're going to get data to the right people at the right time. If the people have the data, then they're going to use it and they're gonna implement more informed and better decisions. And also that includes a box here that says the recipients have to be willing to receive and use the data. That's where the transdisciplinary piece comes in. If you're involving the people who need to use the information from the very beginning, they're going to be much more likely to use the data because they have ownership, they have buy-in, they have trust in the process. So if we have all of that, then we're going to have our social and, and environmental outcomes that we want that are all the way on the right side of your screen. Okay, and then you might want to convert that result chain into text in your proposal because sometimes people have a hard time looking at a results chain and knowing what other people are talking about. And so you, once you have your results chain written out, you can write it in paragraph form to help the reader, to help the reviewer in this case of a proposal understand exactly what you mean to be successful, you know, blah, blah, blah. So you can start, you can take that results chain and turn it into a narrative in written text. So you can say things like, these conservation actions would have their own specific chains, ultimately leading to a reduction in direct threats. Finally, the chain below shows that in cases where data collected are not sufficient, then there's a feedback loop. So just the things that we just walked through are written out in, in plain text to help the reader follow the results chain and more clearly understand what's meant by the words that are in those, those boxes. If this happens, then that will happen. And if this other thing happens, then we're going to achieve our final objective, our fundamental objective. Any questions, thoughts, or confusions? Okay. Another example, going back to example I have a. Consulta. Perdón. Uh -huh. Hi, I do have a question. Sorry, my internet connection is very poor. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. No, se ve que no se escucha. Sí, sí, te escuchamos. Adelante con la pregunta. Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead with the question. Ah, ahí está. Perfecto. No, There la cosa okay. es siempre que hacemos okay. la cadena de resultados so tenemos que hacer is, when we have the results chain, do we need to write it out in text format? Is that compulsory? So, o sea, siempre on, que hacemos... on what, what, what would the process be like? Is it always two parts of the process? And what they're looking for? I suggest doing it both ways because I think it's a way to clearly communicate, but it's completely up to 
um, I would ask that of Anna and, and, and her team of what they're looking for in that, in, in that instance. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Amanda, to follow up on that, we are right now finalizing the guidelines for the proposal, and we will be sending that out in the next two days or so to everyone. So you'll have more information there. Perfect. That's great. Yes. So, so yes, stay yes. tuned. I, I always, Anna, I always recommend doing the, ch the results chain because I think it impresses the funders, even if they don't ask for it, it's impressive to do a results chain. And then in the narrative, if there's time, if there's space and the justification to write it out in plain language so that the, the reviewer knows exactly what it is that you're, that you're saying, and you can refer back and forth to the results chain. I think that's good best practices, but you want to tailor it to whoever you're applying for, for, for funding. Enrique? Enrique, you have a question? I want a pregunta. Sí. Yes, hi, we have a question. Leticia Gomez from Mexico. Is there software so that we can build the results chains where we can see the parameters of the charts, the rectangles and the guide? Is there software? Go into the, 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 the minutia of like, why are there little triangles and things like that? Because for me, that's too much information. It's too It's too difficult to keep all the things straight. The open standards for the practice of conservation has a guide and I'll show you, um, let's see if I can go back. Let's see if there's, this is where this comes from, the you know, human welfare target versus threat reduction result. And to me, I don't go that level of detail because I find that to be, um, extra work for, and that's not necessarily as relevant for the type of work that we're doing writing a proposal. So I don't wanna discourage you from adding the little triangles and being very, uh, very specific. That's great if it, helps you, if it helps you to be organized and to follow your train of thought, fantastic. But I don't think it's necessary uh, for, for this type of proposal to have that level of detail. It's, to me, it's, it's um, superfluous. So yeah, Thank so you. what you're talking about is, yeah, they're not, uh, here, here, like Thank here's you. the little triangles in the corner, the boxes and things like that. I, I wouldn't, I didn't mention that on purpose because I thought it was, it's, it's a little too detailed. Dole? Hola, eh, bueno, acá desde Uruguay. La pregunta que tengo Hi, es from un Europe, poco con, My con la question que has to do with what you were saying about the results versus the activities. I think this has to do with how the specific specific objectives have been set. You were providing an example, and in that case, it was clearly an activity, you know, a workshop. Um, its objective might be to create uh, an opportunity to exchange ideas, for instance. And that should be our objective or result so that we understand that in a context where communities don't exchange ideas, it's important to create these opportunities. So how can we say, state that clearly in this results chain as an outcome, you know? It's, it's difficult, but many. So, uh, this is a case of many social interventions. You know, part of the first outcomes and objectives is to create a forum for people to participate or exchange ideas, you know? because they find no other way to participate or to be heard. And it's not so much if that voice is included or not. That's an, a further level of complexity, which is not always a name. Is my question clear? So my question is, is it possible to, do, to have that as an outcome or should it be something very specific, you know? Yeah, that's a great question, Soleil. You see this all the time. So the, the point is, is that just having the workshop is not sufficient. That's an action, not a result. We want to say we have the workshop and now because of that workshop, 
we have more in common. We have a common, sh a shared understanding of the issue. We have action items, next steps. Sometimes that's hard to measure because they're intangible. Trust, we've built trust. How do you measure that? Sometimes you can have inter like exit interview interviews or surveys after a workshop that can help you understand that. And sometimes you might not know, and that's okay because in research, we have to make assumptions. Uh, but the idea is, is to not report out, oh, we did such a great job. We had so much success. We had five workshops. The idea is, no, we had such a great project. We had so much success because we had five workshops that resulted in building trust, building a community, identifying next steps, helping uh, the, the community understand better the issues and, and the, the problems and the solutions. Those are the outcomes, not the workshop itself. Because what if we have a workshop and everyone's like on their emails and on the phone and not really paying attention and you say, oh, it was, we did our workshop and now the problem is solved. Well, maybe not, you know, and, um, or maybe the workshop wasn't the right time of year to get the right types of people at the table. Maybe it missed certain actors, indigenous groups or members of society that need to be there that aren't there. And you say, oh, okay, we had the workshop, but we wanna do it again in a different place or a different setting or with different people to better reach our outcome. So you're thinking about why, the why of the workshop, not the how or the what. The how or the what is the workshop and how you're going to organize the workshop. The why is the reason why you want to have the workshop in the first place, and that is your outcome. Thank you. Again, Mas? Anyone else? Hola. ¿Qué tal? Gabriela desde Argentina. No, Hi, me... Gabriela from Argentina. Amanda, si cuando mencionabas también uh, el porqué, que es la razón. Uh, I was wondering when you mentioned the why, why hold a, a workshop, and what for it is also useful, right? It's like the purpose. What are we holding the workshop for, let's say? That's, that would also help us with the results or outcomes. Is that right? That's right, That's right Gabriela. It's, it's the, it's sometimes it's intangible, you know, to, to be able to report out, but you can describe, especially working with social scientists. I love working with social scientists. I'm a natural scientist. I'm a biologist, but I include social scientists in my workshops because they know how to measure that. I don't, I'm like, hey, it felt good. Everyone was getting along and it, you know, you could feel the energy. That's not scientific. You can't put that in a paper. You can't put that in your results. A, a social scientist knows how to do that. Yeah. Gracias. Vengo, yo soy socióloga, entonces vengo de ese you. I am a sociologist, a sociologist. So, you know, that's my thing. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, well, we'll move forward, but anytime, please stop in, ask questions. So we talked about why, you know, why you want a result chain. We talked about what results chains are, but now we're moving into how, how do you create a results chain? As I mentioned before, you start, you know, you read a results chain from left to right, but you create a results chain from right to left. So you start with the, the fundamental objective or the overarching goal. And then you say, what has to happen in order for that goal to be reached? The next step is that, well, you kind of know what you're doing in terms of your research. You know, the, the you know, the subject matter, you 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 know you have some ideas. You're not going to build a rocket ship to the moon if you're a biologist. That's not in your in your capacity. So you think you know you think you know what you're going to do, and you know what you want it to achieve. So you have the two bookends on the bookshelf, and then you need to connect. So we're going to go from right to left to to connect those. Those middle parts are the outcomes. Again, not the actions, not the implementation, 
but those middle parts are those outcomes. Next step, number four, these are like rules of thumb or best practices. Best practice number four is to, once you have your results chain mapped out, write it as a theory of change. A theory of change is just a results chain that's written out in text. So we had a question in the chat that said, is the results chain and a theory of change the same thing? Yeah, it's the same thing. A results chain is mapped out with these little boxes and arrows. And the theory of change, well, is contained in that results chain. And then you can also write it out in plain English or plain Spanish or plain Portuguese. You wanna write out exactly what it is that you're trying to do that the, that the results chain says. Best practice number five is to seek technical assistance. This isn't easy. There's a reason why they're not, you know, this is not standard practice in a lot of places. We don't have a lot of practice. Once you do it once or twice, you start to get better and it becomes easier, but it takes, it takes practice to do this right. So working with a facilitator that understands the process can be really, really helpful. And I know that with your projects here that you will have a facilitator working with you. So that's that's great. I, I'm uh, excited that the IAI is, is working with you uh, hands-on like that. Here are some, um, some links that you can click on in the slides once these are emailed out to you to get some ideas of uh, some resources to help understand how to, how, to, uh, how to make results change. The open standards is available in both Spanish and Portuguese. And again, the open standards might be a little more detailed. Going back to that question about why is there a, a purple triangle and some of these things, it's very detailed. You don't need to know all of that in order to do a results chain for the IAI. Even though Anna is still developing the, the protocol, I am sure that she is not going to go into that much detail because it's very, very, very detailed. And um, to me, that's not the point. The, the point of a results chain is to link your actions to your outcomes. We are doing this research because it's going to have a societal impact in this particular way. Not, we're doing this research to have little triangles and things like that. That's, that's um, the open standards goes into a lot of detail that, that you won't need, but you can use the guide to help you understand the process and, and, and how to make them, it's very helpful. So, short story here. When you're making your results chain. Number one, begin at the end. Think about where you're trying to go and then work backwards. Think about what needs to happen at each step in order to reach that final desired outcome and list those steps. And it's not at the level of an implementation plan. You don't have to say, create a WhatsApp group to continue communicating with people. Maybe you do, maybe that's really important, but maybe it's too specific. So you're trying to think about the, the big, you know, those, those big objectives and those big milestones for the project rather than um, really small scale things that you need to do to implement. A workshop, yes, but uh, we're going to have a workshop at the Sheraton Hotel in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Well, that might be, you know, maybe it's important, but may, maybe it's too specific. When you are reading your, when you're creating your narrative, when you're creating your text narrative in the proposal, you don't begin at the end, you begin at the beginning. So you read a results chain from left to right. So you're going to create the narrative from left to right. You begin at the beginning, you describe the process, and you're listing your assumptions. Stating your assumptions. Assum the assumption here that we are making is this, that, and the other thing. And then if your proposal needs to have a monitoring, evaluation, and learning plan, hey, there you go. It's easy. It's easy to write your mail plan at that point. And again, you're linking your actions to outcomes. That To me, that's the magic of a results chain, is it helps us understand the why behind each of our actions and making sure 
that the work that we're doing is going to have the, the maximum impact. And that's why funders like it so much because funders don't want to fund research. Well, some do. I mean, if it's basic research, you don't need a results chain. If it's just to, to broaden our understanding of scientific knowledge, you don't need a results chain because you're trying to advance the, 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 the field of knowledge, you're the field of science. That's enough for basic research. If you're trying to have research that has an impact on society or on the environment, that's where results chains are important. And the problem with our typical proposal writing is that we write them in the same model as we would for basic science, where we don't, you know, we have one section at the end that talks about the broader, the broader societal impact. And that's it. It's like two paragraphs and you've spent so much time doing your entire proposal and you're tired and you're like, okay, I'm just going to make something up here. At least that's me. This gets you to think about that societal impact from the very beginning and make sure that you're linking those actions to outcome. So how do you do this? The way I do it a lot of times is here in the bottom left. I, I do, I make results chains with sticky notes. I think it's really helpful because you can stand up, get on your feet. If you're face to face, you can get on your feet and that gets the energy up in the room. And you can give people different colored sticky notes and you can say, hey, all the intermediate objectives are blue. All of the actions are yellow, whatever colors you want. And here in the top left, this is, this is a results chain process that I facilitated in Canada. This was in, in uh, Whitehorse in Yukon Territory. And you can see on this wall, you can see they're making these pretty complicated results chains and they're explaining why. Okay, so that's a great way to do it. Um, if you're in virtual land, which we often are these days, working on Zoom or Teams, you can do this with um, Jamboard is a good software. It's free. It's a Google product called Jamboard. You can make, you, it's Jamboard comes with sticky notes and you can put sticky notes up and you can move them around virtually and everybody can see what you can see. So it's a way to do sticky notes virtually. Also Miro is a, is a good program, but it doesn't matter. However it works for you and your team is how it works. Uh, but those are, those are some tips. But getting people together, listening to them, hearing hearing everyone's voices, this need you know to to for the ultimate efficacy, this should be done as part of the transdisciplinary work that you're doing. A results chain can be done without being transdisciplinary. There's no reason to be transdisciplinary to do a results chain. But I know what the IEI is looking for in their work, and they want you to be transdisciplinary and link your actions to outcome. So that gives another opportunity to bring people together build relationships, build trust with the stakeholders that are in, uh, involved in your projects. Any questions about the process? All right, so here's the, the last slide and then I'm gonna show some um, examples from the small grants program, which was the I'm, I'm sure you've talked about it before, but it was the um, the the research program before this one. This is like a checklist for you to consider when you're writing your proposals. And Anna is going to send out a new one of these. Uh, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide, but Anna and and the IEI team, they said they are developing this kind of checklist for you all to to think about how what needs to be included in in the proposal but this is pretty this is the one that we use for the small grants you know we we required that folks stated their assumptions that they created a narrative and there they said we, we said you could do a narrative or a diagram but this will be updated and that is it i'm going to pull up some examples from the sgp but i'm going to stop sharing in order to do that and while i do that um we